support me on Patreon so I can keep my lights on. If you decide to recreate anything, it is at your own risk, and I do not accept the responsibility. You're doing this to me. To show you just how much you don't know. Open your eyes. <laughs> Oh, have I finally done it. I've expanded the realm of human consciousness with this extraction. I wonder what the haters are gonna say now. Pure white crystal. Now that I finally isolated the Salvinorin A, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the pharmacology and how it actually works in the human brain. Consumption of salvia divinorium by the Mazatecans is accomplished by chewing the fresh leaves or drinking the infusion of juice of an extract. Thereafter, the onset of effects occurs about 10 to 15 minutes and they peak at 20 to 40 minutes, with the experience lasting for nearly an hour. When salvia divinorium leaves are masticated, the juice must be retained in the mouth for approximately 10 minutes before being spat out or swallowed to enable the absorption through the oral membranes. The percentage of salvinorin A being absorbed through the oral route in humans was reported to be around 85.8%. Smoking is also an efficient way of consumption. After inhaling the smoke of the dried leaves or the vaporized extract, this drug produces a rapid onset of effects and an intense high within 30 seconds, having a peak about 2-5 to five minutes after. This peak then lasts for about 5-10 to 10 minutes and subsides over 20-30 to 30 minutes. In humans, 200 to 500 micrograms of salvinorin A is the minimum inhalation dose to enable hallucinogenic effects. Salvinorin A lacks interaction with the 5-HT2A receptor, the characteristic target of classical hallucinogens like LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, and DMT. Instead, the drug acts as a selective, highly efficient kappa opioid receptor total agonist binding through hydrophobic interactions with both conserved and non-conserved amino acid residues of the receptor. Kappa opioid receptors are encoded by the OPRK1 gene, and its activation triggers a signaling pathway involving the G-protein subfamily GI-O. This stimulation produces analgesic or psychotomimetic effects. Analgesic basically means a drug that reduces pain, and psychotomimetic basically just means that it produces an effect on the mind similar to a psychotic state. In simpler terms, it just means you go bananas. Kappa opioid receptors are found in the hippocampus, hypothalamus, striatum, amygdala, and spinal cord. These areas are associated with learning and memory, emotional slash stress control, and pain. Many physiological functions are believed to be affected by the modulation of this receptor, including pain relief, depression, anxiety, stress, and psychotic symptoms. The very interesting thing is that salvinorin A appears to be more effective than common kappa opioid receptor agonists, which might be due to the fact that the interaction with the receptor occurs through a different binding configuration, as salvinorin A does not have a ionizable amine moiety. I just want to say I'm reading this off a script and I am struggling to say some of these words. I don't know how people speak with these words like every single day. Anyway, let's get started. I decided to use a large amount of salvia divinorum this time, just because I wanted to get as much crystal as I can. I'm going to be changing the procedure around for my last video just a little bit as this worked a lot better. The first step is to put everything into a jar rather than a beaker. This way, we can shake everything around and it can be a lot easier to cover all of the leaves with acetone. I really want to emphasize using an acetone resistant cap. That really would not be a fun impurity to get out. This time, I actually put the plant material into the freezer alongside with the acetone. I was able to get the acetone to around negative 20 degrees Celsius, and this should work a lot better than our previous video. This time, we're going to do three one-minute pulls with the acetone. Now, each pull, you're going to shake the jar for about 60 seconds, and then you're going to pour that out into a new beaker. It might be a good idea to cool the acetone with dry ice, but most of the time, a very cold freezer will do the job just fine. It's also going to be important to make sure that your cap is on tight as the plant material will get in between when you shake. When I poured the acetone in initially, I thought that it covered all the leaves, but I had to add more as the leaves absorb some of the acetone. You're essentially trying to make a salvia acetone soup. Wearing gloves is a very important step in this as the acetone is extremely cold and the bottle will get extremely cold as well. Once you've shaken the jar for about a minute, you're going to decant as much liquid out as you can. You can use the cap from the bottle to filter some of the plant material from getting in, 
but it's really not needed as we're going to filter through a coffee filter in the future anyway. As I get closer to the bottom where all the leaves are, you can see that my funnel actually gets clogged from all the plant material. This was fixed just by using my spatula and it all flowed out like when you eat Taco Bell. We're now going to start on the second pole. And again, it's very important that you fill the acetone so it covers all of the leaves and that it's not just absorbed through the leaves. Again, everything is shaken and you really wanna make sure that the cap is cleaned out every single time you take it on and off because as you saw before, it did leak a little bit when I shook it. We then decant all of the acetone that we can using the cap kinda as a blockage so not a lot of plant material gets in. Overall, for the three poles, I used about a liter of acetone. However, I would go a little bit above that as I was running really, really short when I got to the end. As I was doing the three poles, I really should have put on another pair of gloves as my hands got extremely cold from handling everything and also the garage that I was in was very cold as well. The total amount of solvent that I ended up with was around 700 milliliters. The next step is to filter through a coffee filter just so we can reduce the bigger insoluble impurities and really any big particles that we don't need in there. The good thing about these bottles is they have a small neck and I can just kind of hold the bottle upside down and let all the acetone kind of fall into the filter from there. What we're gonna do now is let this stand overnight so we can let any insoluble impurities fall to the bottom and we can decant the upper layer. I actually re-put mine into the freezer for the full 24 hours. Once it was done in the freezer for 24 hours, we're going to decant as much of the liquid as we can without stirring up the sediment that fell to the bottom. If you start to see the sediment swirl around, then what I would do is let it sit again in the freezer for a couple hours and then decant again. You can also get a smaller bottle, put everything in there, and that should make it a little bit easier as well. I, however, have a centrifuge and I'm just gonna centrifuge it as that's the easiest way to do it. As I pour these in, I just wanna point out Am I, am I saying this stuff as a tutorial? Because I feel like I am. I, I feel like I'm not actually explaining what I was doing, but I'm actually teaching you how to do it. Maybe I just became hyper-focused and figured it out now, but I, I just thought about that. I then let a fan evaporate all the acetone, and it took about a couple hours. I now have to scrape up all of the extract, and we're going to have to do that with a razor blade. Even though I used very cold acetone, it still pulled a ton of waxes into the extract. This is okay though, since we are going to do naphtha washings. Now naphtha is the solvent of choice that I used, but really any non-polar solvent will work. I would recommend using heptane or something similar, as that's definitely a little bit less toxic than naphtha is, if consumption is the desired goal. I placed a stir bar into the solution, heated it up to room temperature, and then I let it stir for about 15 to 30 minutes, and then you're going to let it settle for about an hour, so all the salvinorm particles will go to the bottom of the beaker. I was very careful when I decanted the naphtha as we don't want any of the solution to get picked up and go into our waste container. You can do it this way, however, I'm pretty lazy and I really want an efficient way, so I use the centrifuge to do it as it's just a lot easier. The major benefit of the centrifuge is really that the particles don't swirl around when you pour out the solvent, so that's why I decided to use it. The main difference in this procedure is I actually ran everything through a DIY activated carbon column. This was the best that I had, and spoiler, it's pretty garbage. It's not garbage in the fact that it doesn't work. It, it definitely works, but I also had to do an additional step because it didn't filter correctly. We're actually going to need to redissolve everything in acetone, and this is what we're going to run through the activated carbon. The activated carbon should pull the majority of the chlorophyll, as it will attach onto that, but the salvinorin A won't. Activated charcoal has a unique structure that allows it to attract and absorb molecules, including chlorophyll. This is beneficial because we don't have to do any of the isopropyl alcohol washings, and it just makes a lot clearer of a solution. You can see that when it started to be filtered through, it started to come out clear. Well, at least at first. Though, I'll get into that a little bit later. I used an excess amount of acetone just to make sure that all the salvinorin A was pushed through the carbon and down into our beaker. A column would have been way more efficient and way better, I just didn't have one and had to make a makeshift one. I used my spatula to move around the charcoal just to aid a little bit in the filtration, but a lot of the charcoal was actually going through the filter and it was pretty annoying. I decided to squeeze the coffee filter with the activated charcoal just to get as much acetone out of the filter as I could. I also decided to wash the edges of the funnel just with some acetone just in case anything stuck to it. As you can see, we got our perfectly clear solution that we should have expected when doing the filtration. 
Unfortunately, this means I have to centrifuge everything again, just so I can get the insoluble activated charcoal to the bottom, and then pour out the acetone. This was the additional annoying step that I talked about earlier. Though the good thing is that activated charcoal is not soluble in acetone, and it was pretty easily removed just by using the centrifuge. I ended up letting it run for about 20 to 30 minutes, and you can see the majority of the charcoal rests on the side and the bottom of the centrifuge tube. When I poured out the acetone, luckily none of the charcoal decided to get up and stir around in the solution, and you can see that our solution is a lot more clear now. It's important to let it run as long as possible, as the solution does look clear right here, but you'll see in just a few clips that there's actually a tiny amount of charcoal still in the solution. I then decided to do a fan evaporation so we can get our crude product and then perform a recrystallization. While this does look like lumps and or powder, it's actually nice crystals with some chlorophyll impurities in there. It's very important to let everything evaporate and make sure there's no acetone in there. The reason why we don't want any acetone is we're going to do a methanol recrystallization and we really don't want to increase the solubility any more than the methanol. Rather than using isopropyl for recrystallization, I actually found a methanol recrystallization online and it actually worked a lot better. We're first going to heat up the methanol so it's boiling and then we're going to pour it onto our crude product. Essentially how recrystallization works is the crude product is not so soluble in the solvent. When we heat it up, the solubility goes all the way up and then when we cool it down, the solubility goes down. However, the impurities remain in the mother liquor and we get some nice fresh crystals. This is because when we go back down to room temperature or colder, it's not so soluble in the solvent anymore. This causes it to precipitate out of solution. It's important to not use too much of the solvent and or too little. And what we're also going to do is we're going to put this into the freezer so we can reduce solubility as much as we can. We're now going to freeze precipitate this for about 12 to 24 hours. And it's important to keep that in there for that time frame. I'll show you the crystal formation difference between about six hours and then 18 hours later. Though this will be for the second recrystallization that we do. This one was left in the freezer for about 24 hours and we're going to remove the aluminum foil on top. When you look down to the solution, you can see that we have these nice white crystals in the solution. At least that's what it looks like. We're going to decant all of the methanol into our waste container and you can actually save it and put it back in the freezer to see if any more crystals form, but 24 hours should be a good time frame for most of them to form. The problem that I had with my recrystallization was there was some slight activated charcoal impurities in there. These latched onto the crystals during the recrystallization process and it made my crystals look black. I was extremely excited when I saw the crystals in the solution because I couldn't see the charcoal. Though when I dried everything and I put it into this vial, yeah, you can really see the charcoal impurities. Apparently the centrifuge did not get it all. So I decided to redissolve everything and then we're going to centrifuge again and then we're gonna recrystallize a second time with some brand new methanol. I made sure to wash the beaker that I used for recrystallization where all the crystals touched and I decided to redissolve all the crystals into acetone again. This way, I could dump everything into a tube, centrifuge, pour out the solution, fan evaporate again, and then recrystallize. The interesting part is the crystals actually took a little bit longer to dissolve than the crude product. I always find that very interesting when that happens. Anyway, I really made sure to wash out the vial and the beaker as much as I could, just so we got every single crystal into solution. You can see that when I dumped the liquid out, it's nice and clear, and at the bottom of the tube, you can see that we actually do have our charcoal impurity. This is the thing that ruined everything. So thanks a lot, activated charcoal. You were first so good to me, and then you decided to destroy me. It was then put under a fan, so we can evaporate all the acetone out. And here is our much cleaner product. Now, you could technically use this and call it pretty much pure, but we're going to recrystallize and make it look a lot more cosmetically beautiful. Also doing a second recrystallization will remove any of the other impurities that are in there, though there shouldn't be a lot. As before, we're going to heat up the methanol, redissolve everything, and make sure that we use enough so everything's dissolved and that there's no crystals remaining in solution. I also wanna show you why doing the full 12 to 24 hours is extremely important. This is a solution that I left six hours into the freezer. You might see that the crystals were formed and you're like, okay, I got all my product. Though this really isn't the case. So what I decided to do was pour the excess methanol into another container and dry the crystals. This solution will be put back into the freezer for another 18 hours. And this is the amount of crystals that we got after six hours. It's very tempting to want to take it out once you see crystals, but you must leave it in the freezer for at least 12 to 24 hours. 
We're going to fan evaporate all of the methanol out and we're gonna get our dry crystal product. As you can see, the crystals are very good and they're very white. I scraped the rest of it out and I put it into a vial. The six hour freeze precipitation gave me about 23 milligrams of pretty pure product. Now I wanna show you how much crystals were actually left in the solution as well. Here, you can see that we actually had 35 milligrams left over. This is why it's important to do the full 12 to 24 hours. You could be missing out on beautiful, clean product. The total recovery was about 58 milligrams and it looks quite beautiful. I just wanna thank everyone for all the advice and I really appreciate everything. Now, I also wanna briefly mention safety. This is extremely pure. Do not smoke this. A extremely large dose is one milligram of this. You will be seeing God if you decide to do this. It's even very hard to measure out and you need a specialized scale if you're gonna do that. But if you do decide to do it, well, good luck. Please subscribe as it keeps me going and it keeps me motivated and I thank every single one of you for doing that.